Hello, internet friends. This is Lisa. This is my channel, Soulful Spinning. You've come across a channel that is devoted to fiber, wool, spinning, knitting, weaving, rug hooking, maybe all kinds of different things you can do with wool. So how is everyone today? I hope, you're, I hope uh, whenever you see this, wherever you are in the world, this finds you well. I thought I would pop in here this Friday afternoon and give you a little update on some of my projects here at the house. So, yeah, I've been um, kind of reassessing all of my making supplies. I have quite a lot of various things that I've, I've accumulated, curated over the years. And um, was, uh, up, I have a room upstairs where I have basically like an attic space at this point because it's just filled to the brim with uh, wool, yarn, fiber, fabric, thread. I was in there today and I found the cutest little, um, it's, a, it's a wool hooking design. I'll post a picture of this right here and it, it has everything uh, needed to make it. it has, I bought it as a kit and it has um, you know, the, the, all the yarn, um, I even have a frame for it to put it, put in, you know, a stretcher frame to put into it. And I was watching, um, I've discovered, I, I don't know, I've been living in a cave or something, but I've just discovered Kate over at the last homely house. It's like, how could I have missed this wonderful person for like five years? But I've come across her channel, which I, I'm sort of just watching random episodes and, uh, they're such a delight. I, I don't know if you're a follower of Kate at the last Homely House, but uh, yeah, she's very, very inspiring, and uh, she's a, a quilter. Well, you know about her if you've watched. Today is the 28th of April, 2022, and uh, my name is Lisa, and I'm coming to you right outside of the uh, Chicago in the Midwest of the U.S. So I actually have a lot to show today because I, I didn't podcast last week, so I've been uh, normally putting up a video every every Saturday night here around, you know, between six and um, six and eight Central Standard Time here in the States. But last week I took a break. So I have actually quite a bit to show you today. So where shall we begin? A finished, finished skeins. I'll show you my skeins over here. So I have a few finished uh, skeins of yarn. This first one is my Black Welsh Mountain. If you watched my Spin Softly video, this is what I was spinning. Uh, I was trying to learn the one-handed uh, method of spinning. And this came out really extremely lofty, a lot of air, and it came out quite thick, I would say. It's uh, definitely a worsted weight. Um, but it's wool and spun, so I'm finding that with wool and spun yarn, you can you can uh, knit it at a variety of gauges because it's so filled with air. It sort of is more uh, it's it's more flexible in terms of gauge. So yeah, so that's my Black Welsh Mountain. It's really really squishy, and of course the color is just beautiful. It's beautiful dark natural black. Uh, this one you've seen before. This is my um, Clador wool or Irish wool that I received from Susan from Wild Cottage Craft. I think she, I think I talked about that skein of yarn in another episode. And then this one is North Ronaldsey, and this was also spun woolen. I wasn't quite uh, able to do a completely one-handed draw on this one, but definitely uh, a long draw. It's beautiful soft gray with little black fibers, probably from the outer coat. So North Ronaldsey is a dual coated sheep uh, that uh, lives on the island of North Ronaldsey. But I think they take them, I think they, they're found in other places now in, in Scotland. So I've got quite the collection here of three naturals. So I've got these three. And then I did uh, spin up in my last video, I showed, uh, I demonstrated how I applied from a plying ball on a spindle, and I made a tiny skein of this a fin wool. 
And I have to say, it's, it's a little bit over, uh, over applied in, in parts. Uh, I, th I find that when I ply on a spindle, I get more applying twist. But uh, some, of the, some of it's not over applied, but some of it's definitely over applied. So that's a little bit of fin wool. And this is part of a fleece I have. So I've been working on my weaving. I have a 25 inch shocked flip loom. It's a rigid heddle loom. And I have on there what I told my husband is the never ending warp. Because, uh, let's put this over here. I had warped this up probably December of 21, maybe. I know it was during COVID because I was uh, talking to my family via Zoom instead of actually getting together for the holidays. But I'll be darned, I cannot get to the end of this warp. So it's, it's quite a long piece of fabric. I, the warp is made out of it's this, this beautiful, I'll show you what I'm weaving here. So this, this is the yarn that's the warp, and it's Barocco Sesame. And it is a blend of, I know it's got some synthetic fibers in here. It's 43% wool, 39% acrylic, 9% cotton, and 9% nylon. And it's holding up quite well under tension. And then the weft is this baby alpaca. And this is from Puna Amano Yarns. I had three uh, hanks of this. I had to break into the second hank, but one hank was enough to get almost to the end of my warp. So. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the fabric. I was thinking of making, just leaving it as a big shawl. But I've been watching uh, a YouTuber called Sarah Howard. Sarah Howard makes fabric on rigid heddle looms, and then she sews garments out of the fiber, out of the um, fabric. She has a Etsy shop where she sells her patterns. And she's got a lot of great tips on how to cut the weaving, how to secure the edges. And she's got some nice garments, so I was thinking I could try to maybe make a simple tunic. I might end up just, you know, uh, leaving it as a shawl with fringe. We'll, we'll see. Hopefully uh, this afternoon, I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, that I would be having this weaving done, and it's taken a lot longer than I anticipated. It's only my third project on the loom, and it's almost the complete width and uh, it's a little awkward with the long, uh, with the long shuttles. I would definitely not go uh, much wider than than that for a rigid heddle, because of the, you know, you, you have a long heddle and it's it's just kind of awkward. You got to have a lot of room because you have to have room on both sides. But I've been working on that, and I I am going to work on that some more today, and then I'm anxious to uh, warp up some of my hand spun. Uh, to see how my hand spun operates in the loom. I have my eye on a smaller loom. I was thinking of, of buying a Kromsky Presto loom. It's a 10 inch loom. And I've, I've been doing research on this for months. But I, I just watched, uh, when I watched Sarah Howard, she uh, weaves on a, a knitter's loom by Ashford. She has a 20 inch, but I, because I have a 25 inch loom right here, uh, I think I'm going to go with the 12 inch. And I like that number one, it's com it comes completely finished and put together. It comes with a carry bag. And I, I was going to get the variable dent. Uh, so a rigid heddle, here, I'll show you what a heddle looks like if you're not a weaver. So this is a heddle. And this is, this is the size uh, loom that I have. It's, you can see it's, it's pretty long. And you can get uh, reeds that are variable size so that you can warp different uh, thicknesses of thread. But 
I decided for a 12 inch loom, that's probably not the best idea. And I, I, so I just went ahead and I think it comes with a seven and a half inch, it, uh, it's ends per inch, which is good for like worsted weight. And then I also purchased a 10 inch, a 10 DPI, dense per inch. And uh, yeah, so what you do evidently is you figure out your wraps per inch of your, of your wool and then divide it by two and then round to get the appropriate size. That's just one thing you can do. Weaving is just a, a vast subject that I know very little about, but I like the idea of just letting the yarn sing in the simple plain weave rather than um, jumping into lots of complex weaving patterns and you know shaft looms and stuff. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I found a video on, on YouTube where it's called hybrid warping, where it's, it's, a, it's a way to warp your rigid heddle with a warping board. It's genius. I'll, I'll post the link. If you're, a, if you're a rigid heddle weaver, you might be interested. I'll go ahead and I'll post that link in the description. Everything I talk about today will be linked in the description. So yeah, so that's been my weaving. All right, so the other thing I've been working on is the sweater. My, like my husband says, this, this uh, color work sweater is uh, a long-term relationship. It's, it's not a short-term relationship. I had spun up a sweater quantity of, of course now I'm all tangled here, but we'll get that sorted later, right? I had spun up a bunch of uh, California variegated mutant C CVM. So CVM is a type of Rommeldale. Uh, Rommeldale was a uh, is a purebred sheep, but it was a, its origins are Rambouillet and Romney, I think. So I am knitting the arboreal sweater. I want to lose my stitches here. By Jennifer Steingas. Here we go. And here's my progress. I had to rip back almost two inches because I was sort of, well, I think I was watching Kate at the last Homely House and <laughs> I just was like knitting away and I, I didn't, I didn't read the chart correctly. Luckily, I only had to rip back, you know, like I said, a couple inches, but and painstakingly pick up all the stitches. Well, I really wanted to cry when this happened, but I figured, oh no, this is just a good opportunity for you to learn how to correct, make corrections and color work and pick up, you know, and more time with my hand spun. So I got over it and I continued. But here's my progress so far. Really pretty. I made a hat uh, out of this pattern. I don't have it with me at the moment, but you've seen it if you've watched the last couple episodes. And I know that this is going to block out uh, into this very nice velvety fabric. So what am I knitting this out of? This is my yarn. So this is the this is one of my hanks of yarn spun up. I spun it woolen. Uh, I think I used my double treadle. And this is what the wool looked before. I still have some of the fleece uh, left over. So it's this beautiful you can see it's it's beautiful chocolate brown and it's spun up into a really nice uniform color and uh, it's knit, there was my uh, tummy growling and uh, yeah I'm really enjoying uh, I'm really enjoying the the spin so the other wool that I'm using is another fleece this is California variegated mutant also and this was the before uh, this is the ball I'm working from. I had one hank of this, and it has been enough to knit the whole hat that I made, and it's enough to make the color work. But I, I was worried that I would might run out. So, yeah, I dug this out of my stash. This is this was an uncoated uh, fleece, and it was a little dirtier than, say, a coated fleece, so it was a little more work to uh, to process but 
this is what the bat looks like. I'm spinning up another couple of ounces because I was worried I might need more. Luckily, I don't need more, but yeah. So here's a bat from this wool. And then here's a bob, and I have uh, one ounce already spun up. And I was trying to match up the, the gauge. So I have a default. My default is pretty much a two-ply DK, you know, light worsted DK for the most part. So yes, from fleece to yarn to finally a finished uh, 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 waltz of progress. I hope to get this done soon. Of course, I was stymied with my with my mistake. I got really hard, uh, was very hard on myself for making that mistake, but then it was fine. So yeah, so that's my hand spun. Yeah, just so so satisfying. So what else has been going on around here? Been focusing on that sweater that's the main knitting that I've been doing uh, I have been working on a pair of socks uh, which I think I'll show you here I've got them right here so yeah, here are my socks uh, this is uh, just some uh, superwash merino from ancient I think it's sock NATO by ancient ancient arts in the colorways, the bees knees, and then I'm I I'm, I've started the other one because uh, I like to sort of knit them simultaneously on a 2.25 millimeter needle uh, cast on 64 stitches with a German twisted cast on, and now I'm knitting the leg of this one. But <laughs> but yesterday I was uh, I was working on the cuff, and I'm like, okay, I better just uh, this one is ready for the heel flap, so. Uh, we were watching TV, so we're binge watching Vera. I think we're in season 10, maybe. So I'm separating the stitches on the four needles because I work with four needles for the work and the fifth to knit. And I only had 60 stitches, so evidently I couldn't count up to 64 when I cast on. But uh, I just increased the 64 for the leg, and I think it'll be fine. So yeah, it was my week for making mistakes. So yeah, I think I'm becoming a sock knitter, which is pretty cool. So speaking of socks, from my bookshelf this week, I've got I've got a couple of selections from my bookshelf this week. Um, one of them is this book by Kate Atherley. Now I had shown a book like this yes uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was. Laura Neal's book on socks. I think it was called Sock Architecture. But lo and behold, this one was on my shelf and it was kind of stuck way at the end and I forgot that I had it. And uh, this is Custom Socks Knit, Knit for Your Feet. And uh, another really excellent book on the details of sock knitting. Kate uh, went through the... Uh, she did a... Well, she has, um, here's the table of contents on sock sizing, how a sock is supposed to fit. She talks a lot about negative ease, and that's something that I really was not that attuned to, like specifically how much negative ease. And, and so she's got information in there about uh, figuring out how many stitches to cast on in various gauges. She obviously loves data because she did a, a survey to, to do all these different measurements of people's feet, and then she averaged them out. And, uh, she, and, and so what she has is, she has, uh, you know, are you in the average? Because most sock pattern, patterns are written for a specific kind of dimensions. And then she has a whole section on customizing for various uh, different, different things, you know, if you need a, you know, well, you know, if you've got a wider um, ankle than the average for the size of your foot or skinny, skinnier ankle. And 
uh, excellent, excellent information. And then, of course, she's got something that really I really appreciate, and she's got a worksheet here where you can, based on your gauge and what size finished sock you need, she has all the numbers worked out for you. Stitch and row numbers for the basic top-down sock pattern. And so she's got charts galore. And then she also has it for toe up as well. When I was talking about Lara Neal's book, a, a viewer asked me if, they, if, if she had anything about knee socks. And uh, in sock architecture, Lara Neal's book, I couldn't find anything on knee socks. But if you're interested in knee socks, Kate does address knee socks in, uh, on adjustments for non-average feet. And she has how to figure out your, how to do all your measurements and then to account for your calf. So yeah, this was really excellent. And, and plus she's got just regular patterns in here that you can follow, toe up, sock down. It's a cute. Here's a cute cable, cabled sock pattern. Finely knit socks that actually feet, fit, actually feet. Finely, finely knit socks that actually fit. Yeah. So yes, this is excellent. If, if you're, um, I, I like having uh, resources in my in my personal library for this kind of thing, and I did figure out that. For my gauge, I, I averaged 30 stitches per four inches on socks, that I do need a 64 stitch sock. Though I think I might try a 60 stitch sock to see if I can get one that uh, fits a little uh, snugger, but not too snug. So yeah, Custom Socks by Kate Atherley, excellent book. Have a little sip of tea here. It got cold because I was uh, baking with my son today. Uh, we were baking banana bread today. And then I also have uh, chocolate chip cookie dough in the, in the refrigerator. I, I made it yesterday and I put it in the fridge for overnight and I'm gonna make some of that this afternoon. So what other books? So uh, if you haven't been following uh, Carrie and my wool mitten, uh, I uh, strongly suggest if you're interested in farm life, uh, shepherding, uh, she's a lovely lady that lives in the middle of the mitten and she raises Cory Dale and now Shetland uh, 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 sheep. And she was talking about having a May mitten along, um, so to make mittens in May. And she got this idea from Elizabeth Zimmerman, Knitter's Almanac. So in uh, Elizabeth's book, and of course I didn't, I see, yes, I saved it. So she's got pat, things to work on for every, every month of the year. And this is the chapter, May. Uh, May, May mittens. Mittens for next winter. It is better not to make mittens in a hurry. When snow flies and small frozen hands beg for warmth, the actual knitting tends to be perfunctory and possibly scamped. One econo economizes on the number of stitches. One does not make the cuff sufficiently long. The main object then is to turn out scads of mittens to appease the demand and enjoyment of production is not what it might be. Let's make them in May. Let's take our time over them. Let's venture into new approaches and designs. Let's enjoy them. For the compulsive knitter, hot weather need not put a crimp in his or her activity. Large projects may lie heavy and warm on the lap, but small things like mittens and socks are easy to carry about outdoors and can be made surprisingly fast. Stash them away as they are finished, and when the time comes next winter, you can deal them out with a liberal hand. So Carrie was saying that she would want to have a knit, uh, a knit along. Now, when, when she does sock a knit alongs or mitten alongs, there's no prizes or anything. It's just sort of a let's all make mittens, uh, share what we're making, and encourage each other. And, uh, and if you're a hand spinner, you know, hand spin for your mittens. So I thought that was a great idea, and I'm thinking about what kind of mittens I might like to make in May. I like the alliteration, too. <laughs> a May mitten along. 
So with that in mind, I, I looked at my shelf again. My, I have a, over the years, I've been very fortunate to have had the funds to buy books about my crafting, and I'm so, so grateful for that. I have two books here <clears throat> that I wanted to show you. Uh, by the way, I'm not, um, I'm not an affiliate uh, for Amazon or any other vendor. So I usually, if I do reference the book in the description, I'll usually uh, try to find just the publisher's page. Um, I encourage you to buy books wherever you feel comfortable buying books. So you know, I'm not hawking the book or anything and don't feel like you have to go, you know, you don't, don't, don't buy it or anything. Maybe your local library can get it for you, etc. But this book's called The Mitten Handbook. And the Mitten Handbook is an everything you need to know guide for designing and knitting customized mittens from start to finish. Mix and match cuffs, thumbs, top shapings, and edgings galore to make your own unique mitten creations. Sort of what Ann Budd did for get, getting started knitting socks. This is a kind of a, analogous. So uh, Mary Scott Huff has, of course there are patterns in here that you can follow, but what the book is mainly about is the anatomy of mittens, uh, the components, so edges. So she's got all these different ideas for how you might edge your mitten, your cuff, what kind of thumbs you might want to use, <clears throat> and how you might want to close up the mitten. And then she has patterns here. And then she has techniques about measuring. And like Kate Atherley does in her book, she's got a worksheet. And she teaches you how to measure your hand to get the, the perfect size. And there's some really cute mittens in here, too, if you just want to follow along. So there's the pretty lime green ones. Those are really pretty. Uh, this, this mitten is actually knit flat and seamed, which, you know, if you're, if you like to knit with straight needles, uh, she has instructions for how to do that. Um, she also has little wrist, wristers. Well, what's neat about this book is you could really create your own pattern. So here's, here's one too. Uh, with a stitch dictionary, a color work stitch dictionary, you could create your own cuff along the, the edge. And here's one that's a Guernsey pattern. I know that the Albanach knitter recently had a, a Guernsey knit along where people were knitting. One of my friends, she made a beautiful pillow uh, with all these different uh, Guernsey textures. Isn't that pretty? So, and then she's got the different components, and then you could, of course, you could, you could, uh, you know, if you like to do an afterthought thumb, you could just make that adjustment versus, you know, just ran out of, I went 30 minutes. So these are also knit straight and seamed, and they're knit sideways, and they've got a really cute cuff there. So yeah, I'm excited about um, making another pair of mittens. So there's different. See how she's got different ways to uh, close up the mitten. Pointed, anatomical, spiral. I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it's analogous to the sock book. It gives you all the different options, but I think mittens are a lot easier to make than socks. So that's one for your consideration. And then I have this one. Uh, this one is Favorite Mittens, Best Traditional Mittens from uh, Fox and Geese, Fences, Flying Geese, and Partridge Feet. Uh, when I bought this one, I was a pretty new knitter, and I, I didn't understand the directions. Uh, yes, I just, I, I just, I hadn't had any mittens under my belt, and so for some reason I was having problems following some of the uh, instructions, but... Uh, this one is got mostly, it's mostly uh, black and white, but in the center of the book, it has uh, color pictures of the mittens. <coughs> really cute. These remind me of the uh, mittens from 
Newfoundland that I uh, that I showed uh, some time ago. So yeah, a lot of different really traditional patterns. And then here's one for a little a little kid, a little baby. You could do an I cord or a crochet cord. Yeah, really charming. This definitely uh, reminds me of pattern watch cap to match your mittens. So it's just got a recipe. So most of it's in black and white, but then you have your uh, color pictures on the inside. So yeah, I'm going to look at this one too and see if I can get uh, some ideas on uh, what I might, maybe I'll make more than one pair of mittens in May. May mittens. It's got, it's just it's got instructions in here on how to do a thrummed mitten where you, you uh, stuff it with roving to make them super warm and toasty. So yeah, so there's just a couple of books on mittens that uh, I thought I would share with you this afternoon. All right, better wrap it up here. So, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I have a lot of wool. I have probably more fleeces than I can reasonably expect to process <laughs> in, what, five or ten years maybe? But did that stop me from buying another fleece? No. As the quote, this, the shepherd said this was her favorite quote of the season, do I need more wool? No. Do I want more wool? Yes. So I had the opportunity to purchase a Cordale fleece from a favorite shepherd. I really need a fleece like I need the proverbial hole in the head. So yeah, this is one fleece and it's, it was labeled NT because it had no tag. So she uh, lost her tag. I think it was five pounds maybe? No, seven, seven pounds. I don't have the space. I don't have the space today to open it up. Usually I take it outside on a couple of big towels and, and spread it out. It's about in the upper 40s, about 50 degrees today. So I laid it out here on this side. You really can see. It's kind of cold today. But I wanna I wanna see what it looks like. Oh my god. All right, I'm gonna t look at this. You see that? Can't see through there, I don't think. So yeah, this is uh, coated fleece is a thing of beauty. I mean, this is this is dirty. This is unwashed, unreal. Well, I'm pretty good at estimating a pound. I took my fleece, which is here on the floor. In my laundry room, you can hear my washing machine, and um, 
yeah, this is the dirty fleece <laughs> here, unscoured, I'll say. And then here is a pound with my kind of my crude scale. Getting, uh, in my sample, I got a yield of 70%, which I thought was pretty darn good. So, yeah, I don't normally weigh my fleeces. You know, I just wash it and work with it because I always have so much of it that I don't worry uh, what my loss is going to be. But if I was given just a pound of wool, maybe I would, you know, pay more attention to yield and everything. Yes, here it is in all its glory. So, yeah, I'm going to put it in a mesh bag and give it a scour. Look at this. It really has no dirt. That's just lanolin. That's just lanolin. That is, that is what a well-managed, perfectly coated fleece is going to give you. Unbelievable. And this is how it dried. Just, and, oh, here it is, washed. This is about four ounces of it washed. I, I took it outside. It was a sunny day. It wasn't too cold out. I took it outside, laid it out on a towel. And I'll insert some pictures here. This fleece was just right under the coat. There's, there's no, I mean, I couldn't find any veg matter in it. It was so pristine, so clean. And this is how the, um, yeah, it's like going to blind you. You know, put sunglasses on. <laughs> These are how the nests are turning out. Uh, it's medium fine. I think I have a raw lock here, do I? Yeah, I do. I happen to have a raw lock here. Who doesn't have a raw lock just sitting on their desk, right? So this is the raw lock, and it, most of the fleece just has this beautiful French fry crimp, about four and a half inch staple. Washed up beautifully, beautifully white. Let me show you a uh, lock after. So yeah, before and after. I. Uh, I sent my friend, uh, my, I sent my friend a picture of the fleece and she goes, she goes, so you bought washed fleece? I'm like, no, honey, this is clean. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been working on this. I took some numbers. I, I, I just grabbed, uh, a bunch of it and I weighed it and I found that after the washing, I had a 70% yield. So that means I lost 30% of the weight. Uh, to lanolin. And uh, so now I have another pound of it uh, drying on my rack. It's taken quite a while to dry because I don't, I don't have a spin dryer. And even though I roll it into towels and everything, um, it takes really quite a long time to dry. But isn't it just like, what? Like what? I, it's like a marshmallow. It, it's, it looks like marshmallows. It, it's just so pretty. So it was uh, quite a large fleece. I think it was six and a half or seven pounds. Even with a 70% yield, that's a whole lot of wool. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I, I definitely think I'm going to try uh, some dyeing experiments, either on the finished yarn or the locks before I prep. And because uh, I think with this color, the the dye would just take beautifully nice clear colors and uh, yes yeah, very comforting to have wool in your hands as you wool lovers know very well so yeah so that was the new new that came to me and I, I was feeling a little you know you're feeling a little down just just go and and just start playing with your wool I put it in a mesh bag to to wash and uh, yeah, highly recommend. I, I love wool and I've, I have plenty of uncoated fleeces, but you know, a coated fleece from a reputable breeder, you just can't go wrong. So yeah, what else has been going on? What else has been going on? About three or four weeks ago, I, I showed how uh, I made some combed blended top on my hackle. 
and I spun that up on my Ashford e-spinner and I'll show you the result. So this is a project I started um, a little while ago and it's that um, blended top that I made uh, off my combs. And I started spinning it kind of uh, traditionally thin. I was getting reacquainted with my e-spinner here. It's my Ashford e-spinner 3. And I thought it would be fun to uh, spin it in a thick and thin manner and then maybe a uh, spiral ply. And uh, it's been sitting here. I have more to comb, but I thought I'd get some of this uh, recorded. And I'm spun it up into a thick and thin singles. It's um, it was a Rambouillet braid with silk and sp uh, some sparkle and some sari silk, some tussa silk all blended in. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to thread ply it with this cone of silver thread. And uh, I think I have thread plied with this before. It's not super strong. Like if I pull on it really tight, it will break. But I'm gonna spiral ply it. And I didn't, I've got more of, of this fiber to process to turn into a blended top, but I thought it would be interesting to see uh, what it would look like uh, spiral plied. And uh, one of the things I do to prevent losing a ton of twist at the end of the spin, you can see I don't have very much twist there. I'll um, ply back the last little end and then that prevents uh, a lot of the, the wool from un, untwisting on the bobbin. So I'm going to work on that. And so I had a bunch of combing waste from those blended tops and I mixed it with some Polworth top that I had in my stash. I think I added some alpaca too and I think I added a little bit of, of silk to the drum carter. And I made these, I'm calling them spring sky or April sky battlings. And like kind of like little, like Ingle Nook Fiber has her little stickle bats. 
And this was the waste, mostly the waste from the that was left on the combs. And uh, so far, I am spinning this on three of my spindles here. So this one is a True Creations. Uh, this one is from Crivelli. And this one is from Vermont Spindles. And I'm just spinning it into a thick uh, singles that's going to make a nice bulky yarn. So I'm anxious to, uh, to try my hand at weaving with some of these more, you know, thick and thin thick and thin type yarns. So I'm working on that. So you can see I've got a lot going on here. All right, I think that's all for me today. Uh, sorry if I'm, I feel a little disheveled today. Um, feeling just a bit poorly. Uh, yesterday, I think I, I kind of overdid it yesterday. I'm trying to clean and dust and clean bathrooms and you know how it is. Um, but yeah, I, I hope this finds you well. Yeah, I hope that you have a good week, and I hope to be back next week. Um, what do you What do you think? Those of you that have stuck with me to the end here, um, I've been watching a lot of uh, the Last Homely House, and I love how Kate just sort of takes you along with something that she's doing. So you know, let's say I, I get off the camera and I start combing wool and and making fiber nests, and you know, sitting in my wheel and spinning, and then she just chats. Uh, to the viewers and just kind of brings brings them brings you along with her making journey. I think it's so uh, it's it's sort of comforting and, and and really pleasant to watch. Would you be interested? And not that I could ever compare. I mean, you know, I I, I live in a totally different place of the world, and you know, um, I can't really. Uh, what do I want to say? You know, even though I don't live in the north of England and have a wood stove and, you know, an extensive garden, I just live in, you know, a modest house in the suburbs of Chicago. You know, I sort of represent an everyday kind of every woman, right? A woman of a certain age who likes to, uh, you know, make things. So do let me know if, if that kind of video might be of interest to you. I have, uh, I'm getting my sewing machine ready. I'm almost ready to start sewing again. I want to make a quilt. Uh, would you be interested in coming along and seeing my journey in, in those things? So rather than just, you know, having a sit down like today. So yeah, let me know your thoughts and I do hope you're well and I will talk to you very soon. So bye friends for now. We'll see you, uh, we'll see you next week. I think they turned out okay. They're chocolate chip cookies. We don't get to have one until we take our walkie. Are we going to go to the park? Want to go for a walkie and get your leash? Of course you do. Oh. You're such a good girl.
I don't even know what I'm filming because I can't see a thing. Check it out later. Yeah. A lot of dandelions. Peaches and the dandelions. I got a lot of pictures of her and the dandelions and clover. She knows she's always waiting for us. They're good and they, yeah, they're really good. Here. Can you sit? Sit. Good girl. Your hips hurt too, I know. 